So a few years ago, when I was returning from a conference in an airplane, there was a lady sitting next to me. And she was very impressed to know that I work for Microsoft and that I have a PhD in computer science. So I ought to be able to help her with the task that she was struggling with. So she opened up her laptop, fired up Excel, showed me a column of strings that she wanted to map to a different column. And she explained to me what she wanted to do by means of an example. But at that time, I had to excuse myself out of the situation because I had no idea about the programming model underneath Excel. But the first thing that I did when I got back home was to go and look at help forums and figured out that there were many, many people who were struggling with simple map operations like what she was trying to do. So here is a typical interaction that I noticed on a help forum. So an end user on the left side would ask the expert on the right side to give them a program that can transfer the string on the left side of the arrow to the string on the right side. The expert takes a look at this input-output example and sends back a program. In this case, this program extracts the first two characters starting at the fifth one. The end user takes this program, runs it on other input that they have in the spreadsheet, and figures out that it does not do the right job on some other input. So what do you think is the user trying to do here? Yes, extract the substring between the first two underscores. How many of you know how to program this in Excel? So this is one of the simplest programs that you can write with the APIs that the Excel programming model offers you. The user takes this program and uses it to accomplish their task and sends a big thank you to the expert on the help forum. So this interaction takes place over a course of several days. Now I will show you how to automate this interaction in a course of a few seconds. So I built this feature called Flash Fill, which has been in Excel since 2013, that allows automation of such repetitive string transformations through examples. So here you have a bunch of social security numbers. Suppose you want to format them by inserting hyphens as you have in the second column, and you mask, want to mask off certain digits. So of course, if there are hundreds or thousands of rows in your spreadsheet, then doing it manually would be very cumbersome. A more principled way to do this would be to write an Excel macro. But 99% people who use spreadsheets do not know programming, and they will be stuck. But now, thanks to Flashville, they can give an example of what they want and press Control-E to fire this feature. So what it does is it takes a look at the input-output example that the user provided, generalizes it into a program, and runs that program on the rest of the spreadsheet to produce the output that the user wanted. The Excel team did a quite a good job at avoiding the so-called discoverability issue, but that made my life harder in terms of the algorithmic requirements. So suppose you don't know that this feature exists, and you're just trying to do your task manually. And the moment you start doing the second one, it auto-fires. It realizes that you're not trying to create an arbitrary column, but it is a derivation of the first column. Now, in general, it might be too difficult to read the mind of the user from just one example, as this scenario would illustrate. So here I have a bunch of medical billing codes, some of which have a right bracket at the end, while some of them don't. Suppose I want to clean this data by adding a right bracket wherever it is missing. So if I give one example, then the tool will come up with the simplest generalization, which is to add a right bracket everywhere. Maybe this is what I want, and then I am done. Otherwise, I would realize that row 6 to 10 are incorrect. And in order to fix them, I can provide one additional example. And the tool can better converge to the intent that I had in mind. Here is another common scenario that you might have come across. A huge string in the input column with lots of subfields. Suppose you want to extract these different constituent elements. Even if you're a programmer, it will take you a lot of time to think about the logic that you would use. <clears throat> but now with just giving a single example, you can automate this task. The tool can discover quite complicated scripts, in particular scripts that contain loops. So here I'm trying to generate abbreviations. You may do lowercase, you may put peri periods, you may not use the spaces, and it will all work. So this is my last demo here. So I have a bunch of names. What do you think I'm trying to do in column B? 
extract the first uh, character. And here, first two. And here, I'm doing the first three. Now, suppose that you didn't observe me doing the first three columns. What would be a most natural interpretation of what I'm trying to do in the column four? First word. And this is exactly what the system thinks. And if I want to really extract the first four characters, I can give one more example. And then the tool will be able to do that uh, for me. Now, this feature has been uh, inside Excel for uh, a few years. And we got feedback from customers regarding the various scenarios that it is not able to handle, in particular, number transformations and date transformations. And now we have added that support uh, inside Flashville as well. So consider the task of rounding numbers to two decimal places. A task as simple as this. If it has to be done inside Excel or C Sharp, you need to remember this format descriptor. What about Python or C? It is this. And for Java, it is yet another different format descriptor. So again, examples can serve as a very natural way to describe the intent that the user has. Now look at this task where I want to extract the red date from the input string and map it to the corresponding weekday. I want to extract the green time and map it to the corresponding three-hour bucket that it belongs to. And again, imagine how much code you'll have to write and how many minutes it would take for you to accomplish this kind of common bucketing transformation. But we can accomplish this simply by providing one input-output example to the tool. So what else can we use this technology for besides doing map operations? Well, imagine yourself in a data science class. One of the first assignments that might be there in such a class is to take a raw text file and convert it into a tabular form as you see on the right side. Now, in this case, this is a real assignment taken from the data science class run at Brown University as a MOOC. And the instructor provides the students a script to build on top of. So the goal is to take this script, extend it to get a program that can let you go from left to right. You have raw log file, text file on the left side, and you want to extract a tabular format on the right side. Now, Lord, let me actually show you the experience that we can provide to the users for doing such tasks. So here I have loaded the same file inside our uh, demo prototype. And all that I need to do is to simply give examples of the various fields that I'm interested in extracting. So here I've given a couple of examples of the championship name. And the system goes and finds all other instances of the championship name from the rest of the document. In order to extract other fields, all that I have to do is to simply change the color of the highlighter. And now one example suffices because my previous interaction has already put some structure on the document. Now I can go on and extract other things such as the scores. And here the system gets it wrong in the third record. But what if this mistake was not in my viewport? It was somewhere in the middle of the big data that I'm trying to clean. If you are a programmer and writing a script yourself, you are pretty much on your own. So the task of figuring out any errors in the script, you are completely responsible for it. But in this case, we can actually ask the underlying system, where are you confused? And where should I pay my attention to? And the system will actually point you to the third record. In fact, it is asking you, do you prefer, which of the two options do you prefer? In fact, I don't prefer any of those options, but I have gotten to the record that I want to fix. So I'm simply going to give one more example to convey my intent to the tool, and the tool will be able to now extract all the winning scores uh, correctly. So now let's take a look at how does the underlying technology uh, works. So at the heart of these programming by example technologies is a program search engine that takes as input examples from the user and generates a bunch of programs that are consistent with those examples. 
Now, we can potentially search for these programs over some existing repositories, but it is unlikely that the task that a given user is trying to do has exactly been done by another user before. So we actually construct these programs from scratch. Now, if you search for these programs within a general purpose language, then the search would be completely infeasible. So one of the first tricks that we use is to search for these programs within an underlying domain-specific language. So for instance, the domain-specific language that is fixed within FlashFill allows you some basic operations for string transformations, like concatenate, substring, regular expressions, and limited form of conditionals and loops. So a naive strategy for searching over a domain-specific language, which is still infinite in size, might be to enumerate all programs in order of increasing size. But such an enumerative search is still not going to work, because the programs that people want to generate in FlashFill actually are quite big. So we use logical reasoning techniques that exploit the properties of the operators in this domain-specific language to do an intelligent search. But even then, we have many cases to explore. And for this, we use machine learning techniques in order to make intelligent choices about which of the paths to choose. So the underlying techniques are a very interesting blend of logical reasoning and machine learning techniques. So this search engine ends up producing a set of programs that are consistent with the examples that the user provided. The number of these programs is huge, often 10 to the power 50. So these programs are not represented explicitly, but they are represented in a form of a grammar, which is a subgrammar of the underlying domain-specific language D. And then the next task is to rank these programs to figure out the highest ranked program. And for this, we use ranking techniques, in particular those that look at the features of the program. So we normally try to prefer programs that have simpler colmographic complexity. But then we also execute these programs on the rest of the data to see which programs end up producing outputs that look as belonging to a particular data type. And we use these two kinds of features to guide our ranking of these programs. And then we have a technique that points out the cases where the system is not very confident about to the user. And the user might provide more examples, and the process is repeated. And at the end, we get an intended program in the underlying domain-specific language D. So I put out a bunch of references here. If you are interested, you can follow these references to know more underlying technical details. Now let me talk about two key innovations on top of this architecture that I just showed you. So recall the program ranking engine. So the first prototype of FlashFill that I built used to take three to four examples per task on average. And the Excel team told me that, well, they cannot ship this technology unless we get it working with one example on relatively simple tasks. And their point was that even though providing three to four examples is way easier than writing a script, but if we generate funny interpretations after one example, the users would lo lose trust into the system. So that made our life even harder, but we solved that problem. And then a little while ago, a product team asked me, can you do better? How much better can you do than providing one example? Well, it turns out that in certain specific domains, this actually makes quite a bit of sense. So think of parsing a log file. So I showed you a demo where I gave a few examples, and the system was able to construct a parser for me. But if you have many tens of fields to extract, then giving examples would actually be quite tedious for each of those fields. So for relatively simple cases, it turns out that we can synthesize programs from just looking at the patterns in the input data, no outputs required. So I'll show you a demo of this capability. The next innovation is in the context of the kind of programs that we generate. So if you recall, we were generating programs in our underlying domain-specific language D. But we can actually take these programs and translate them in a target language of choice. For example, Scala, R, or PySpark. And these programs are readable and editable programs, something that you would have written yourself. And now this allows us to integrate this program synthesis technologies in existing workflows inside IDEs and notebooks. So let me show you one such concept demo around how we can integrate these program synthesis or programming by example experiences inside notebooks to provide code acceleration. So I'll specifically point out that this is more of a concept demo 
as opposed to any product definition. So consider this text file, which has some metadata at the top, then a header row, and then different records, whose various fields are separated by the semicolon character. Now, if you want to ingest this particular file into a table, you will have to specify how many lines to skip from the beginning, whether or not there's a header row, what is the row delimiter, what is the column delimiter, and so on. So now you can actually use our API to automatically construct such a script. In this case, we'll be generating PySpark programs. So even though this was a relatively simple task, you can now see how much productivity improvement you have. So maybe you are familiar with the Pandas API, but you're not familiar with the file read command that you might have in the uh, PySpark. Or if there are many different columns, you'll have to go and specify the types of each of those columns. But now this code is generated for you completely automatically. So I can take this code and, in fact, execute it. to load the data into a uh, data frame. We can see how many rows uh, we read. So around 300,000 rows. We can look at some sample records. Now let's say we want to figure out when are 911 calls most common. So this data is corresponds to 911 calls. And the description column actually contains the date and the time which I want to map it into a particular bucket. And I showed you this experience in the context of a UI on, on my slide earlier. But now, here is how we can provide a similar experience to programmers, where programmers will simply provide an input-output example. So this is the input text that they want to map it to the corresponding three-hour bucket for the corresponding weekday. And we can learn a program uh, from this input-output example. Uh, so I would argue that this is quite a bit of you know, readable program, and you can even edit it. Uh, uh, let's copy this program and execute it to construct the, the UDF function here. And now we can use it to create a new column in the original uh, data frame, and if you want, we can actually even uh, uh, visualize it, and we immediately know now that most 911 calls are actually made on Thursdays between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Now, when we conducted a user study with Python programmers, they took around 30 minutes to accomplish this task. But now, with the code acceleration technologies that we have, we can accomplish this task in around 30 seconds. So before I conclude, let me actually share with you another fascinating application of programming by example technologies. Think of application migration, such as trying to move from Oracle to SQL Server, or an old version of Spark to a new version of Spark, or maybe going from Pandas library to use of PySpark libraries. In such a typical application migration, 40% of developer effort apparently goes into repetitive code edits. And now you can imagine the user can specify a couple of edits, and the underlying programming by example technology can figure out all the other places where these edits need to be made. Or think of custom formatting. Recently, we took five SQL queries and sent it to 50 different SQL developers. Interestingly, each of them came up with their own unique way that they wanted those queries to be formatted. And they complained about the lack of customization in the code editors that they were using. But this is, again, something that we can accomplish using programming by examples technology. We can actually use it to fix bugs related to performance or correctness. We have observed cases where developers fail to fix that kind of bug at all the locations. But programming by example technologies can actually suggest the locations that you might have otherwise missed. A very intriguing application of repetitive bug fixes 
is actually in the context of creating automatic feedback generation technologies for introductory programming education. So it turns out that the mistakes that students make year after year on a given programming assignment are not that different. So imagine a teacher providing feedback on some programming assignments, and if the system observes a similar kind of mistake that a future student makes, the system can use that knowledge to automatically provide feedback to such students. So let me conclude now. So programming by examples is a new frontier in AI. And the technology has already matured today that it can provide a 10 to 100x speed up for many task domains, including data transformations and code transformations. So data transformations is especially appealing because data scientists apparently are spending 80% of their time just trying to convert data from one format to another, from a raw format to a much more clean structured format that they can use to draw insights from. But to me, the more interesting aspect here is the fact that these kinds of technologies can enable programming for everyone. So today, 99% of people who use computational devices do not know programming. So the technologies underneath these programming by example capabilities are a very intriguing mix of logical reasoning and machine learning. And I believe that there are going to be a lot more innovations in this area in the next third wave of AI. Now, if you think about the programming evolution, we went from punched cars and low-level programming languages to high-level programming languages and beautiful code editors. And the next level of evolution, I believe, will be to take programming closer to human communication by allowing use of examples in natural language. These concepts are actually already present in today's programming environments, but in an implicit way. When we write code, we write test cases. These are nothing more than examples. We write comments, which are very similar to natural language-based specifications. And the next level of evolution will take these artifacts and make them first-class citizens in an existing uh, uh, code authoring experience. So my research and engineering team at Microsoft develops these kinds of technologies for integrating them inside many different Microsoft products. But we also make these technologies available for public academic use in our pros SDK. So you're welcome to try that out. I would love to receive your feedback on the use cases and different surfaces that you can imagine for this technology. So please feel free to send me an email or try to catch me in person at the Microsoft booth in the reception area. Thank you. Would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Questions? Hi there. Uh, this is definitely outside of my field, but I've heard of something called TLA Plus, where you can write a specification, and somehow the system can generate a program that meets your specification. Is this at all related to that kind of work? So what was the name of the work that you referred to? TLA Plus by Leslie Lamport. So is that the specification is in the form of examples? No, it's actually a way of defining a kind of a rigorous spec that says what behavior the program will have, and it's somehow see. the program is automatically generated. I see. So maybe more in the form of preconditions and postconditions that you might write for your program. So in fact, the topic of program synthesis is as old as programming itself. And initially, people did not make too much progress on it. Uh, but in the last decade, there have been tremendous advances in this particular area. Uh, now, the way that the work that I showed you differs from uh, the work on taking specifications in the form of logical specifications is that end users or users may not find it easy to write down uh, these logical specifications. But examples might be a very natural way to specify what you're trying to do. Now, in some cases, natural language might be a better fit. So for example, if you want to, let's say, add up all the positive numbers in an array, giving examples might be quite tedious, because if you have given me an example, you have done the task yourself. Or you have to go and create an artificial small array and give an artificial example. But natural language would be a better way to specify that. And natural language is quite isomorphic to writing down a logical specification. So I would say, depending upon the kind of task that you want to accomplish, 
uh, uh, you might either want to give examples or natural language, or you might want to split the task into different subtasks and then use examples or natural language to specify it. And there has always been a barrier in using logical specifications to even write down assertions in your code. All these advances that are going on in the area of conversational AI and natural language understanding can be brought to fruit here in order to create more natural interfaces as opposed to forcing people to write down formal assertions. Hi. Uh, so my question is, do you think that uh, the machine learning in the next wave will sort of displace the current logical rule-based uh, things, or do you think that there's, there's always going to be a foundation of, of logic and rule-based uh, framework? So given my background in formal methods, I would probably be more inclined to say that there is room for uh, both. Um, if you think about how, let's say, you know, children learn. So they start by developing some basic cognition skills related to vision, speech, language understanding. And this is what the frontier of machine learning has been up until now in terms of making huge advances in these areas. But the next level of understanding that children develop is related to logical reasoning and analytical reasoning. And this is where formal methods, theorem provers, deductive reasoning has been quite good at. Uh, so I actually definitely see a room for combining both these techniques together as opposed to putting my bet on exactly uh, one of them. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> in one of your first few slides, you showed an Excel formula. So uh, I was wondering if the synthesized code is in the form of Excel formulas, since you can think of Excel formulas as a program in the language. Yes. So the underlying domain-specific language that we use underneath Flashville is a small subset of C-sharp that uses some basic constructs like substring, regular expressions, richer form of regular expressions. And because of that, we are able to do the kinds of tasks that you would otherwise have required complicated Excel formulas much more elegantly and succinctly. Uh, so I feel that unfortunately, the Excel formula language is not as expressive for doing these kinds of string transformation tasks. Therefore, we ended up identifying the right set of abstractions of ourselves. And we have a relatively quite small language, but that's the one that we use for synthesis. Once you understand what the user is really trying to do, then it is another challenge to translate that into a language of your choice. So let's say if you really want to get an Excel formula, then you can do another synthesis task, where now the goal is to take the program in the underlying domain-specific language and find an equivalent program in the, let's say, the Excel formula language that has the same functional behavior on the given set of uh, inputs. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I like the last part of the presentation when you generated the code and it seemed that you generated it for just reading data. Do you think that also there are other use cases for the data preparations, especially in that ETL domain, that also you can prepare this code for based on similar, similar methods or methodology? Yes. So if I may uh, rephrase that question, maybe you're asking, what all domains can we use these kinds of technologies for? So there are certain tasks which are uh, quite fuzzy, such as language translation. And this is where existing machine learning techniques would be best at. But if the kind of task that you want to do can be done by writing a small program, then these kinds of technologies might be a great fit. So let's say, for instance, if you want to do uh, anomaly detection, and if an orbit detection can be done by finding a logical predicate, then yes, these kinds of technologies would be good. But maybe there is no logical predicate that characterizes the anomalies, and it is really a very fuzzy operation, then machine learning kinds of techniques would be a, a better fit. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm right here. All right. um, so all the demos that you showed, uh, when you had them do the synthesis task, the response was basically immediate, which is extremely impressive. Um, for the PySpark uh, code generation example, does it use the same uh, DSL? And also, how do you, wh what is the overall structure of that? And how do you make, like, say, a modification that brings you somewhere else in the search space? To, and how do you navigate that search space, I guess? Yes. So uh, uh, if we want to generate, let's say, PySpark code, we don't search in that language. We still search in a DSL that we have carefully crafted for each 
domain. So for instance, extracting tables from web pages is one domain. Extracting tables from PDF documents is another domain. Ex converting JSON from one format to JSON from another format is another domain, and so on. We have typically 10 to 20 such domains that we work with inside at Microsoft. And these domains have been carefully crafted because on one hand, you want them to be expressive enough to capture a wide range of tasks in that domain. On the other hand, you want it to be restricted enough so that you can do efficient searches there. And you want to be able to leverage properties of operators. But once we have synthesized a program in our domain-specific language, it is a different problem now to map it to the given uh, target language. Uh, doing a syntax-directed translation is one possibility, but that might not end up generating very readable code. It might end up generating quite a bit of bloated code. So being able to generate readable code is yet another technical challenge, which is simpler than understanding the intent from examples which are very ambiguous. But once we have solved that problem and we have leveraged our ranking, beautiful ranking algorithms, then we can go on solving a simpler challenge of trying to find an equivalent program in a given target language that is not necessarily equivalent to the program that we have synthesized, but just functionally equivalent to the kind of data that we want to run it on. So, uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, I was curious about the ranking bit and what, what is the general criteria for, for putting things up or down in the rank and whether you use some kind of prior uh, uh, reasoning there. Yes, so uh, initially when we started working on ranking, it was quite manual. We were fiddling with various features and the weights for those features. But now we have brought the process to the stage where we are using machine learning algorithms to figure out the weights corresponding to these different features. So the features are something that we have still written manually. So for instance, for programs in a given domain-specific language, some generic features that are even independent of a domain-specific language might be how many operators are composed, how many constants are being used, what is the size of those constants, and there might be some specific features associated with a particular domain-specific language as to uh, occurrence of certain operators uh, uh, together. And then there are features that we use of the output data that we, that we construct. Uh, for instance, is the output all a specific data type? Like is the output all dates, or the output are all numbers of five digits and so on? And then we use machine learning techniques to figure out the weights that we can associate to these different features. The number of tasks that we typically have in our uh, benchmark is around 1,000. Uh, but for each task, we are able to generate a lot of data. Uh, so for each task, we typically get uh, thousands of correct programs and uh, uh, trillions of incorrect programs. And uh, we can use that kind of multiplication that naturally happens to get a lot of training data to create good um, uh, machine learning models. 